I'm interviewing Mr. No. <laughs> we gave him that name uh, last time we had him on the show, Bob Ackerman of Allegis Capital. And he's uh, been around. He funded the first iPhone before Apple did. <laughs> and he actually has it hanging on the wall. It was a Cisco product back then. And uh, he's, he gets to see a lot of pitches, a lot more than I do. So we're going to talk about the world and the conference I'm speaking at with him. And we'll have a lot of fun talking to Mr. No. <laughs> Bob Ackerman. I think we just call it. And who are you? Well, I'm Bob Ackerman, founder of Allegis Capital. And uh, where? Mr. No, some people call me. I did. So yeah, it's uh, thank you very much. I've uh, my my kids relate to that. So. <laughs> they don't like that. About they don't you. like that name. <laughs> Neither do the entrepreneurs who are pitching you. I say yes occasionally, so just to just to mess with them. Huh? Not well, you know, look, I'm I'm looking to say yes, right? I'm in the business of saying yes. It's just sometimes it's it's hard to find things to say yes to. Yeah, it is. So. Uh, you know, I get pitched so many times a day that I I can't imagine what it, your life is like. Uh, what are you seeing happen in the world lately? You know? Well, you know, it's 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 interesting, Robert. It's just the the level of innovation that's taking place, you know, today is certainly is unprecedented in my career, and that that covers a few years. Uh, but you know, it seems like everything is up for grabs today. Uh, you know, it, w whether you're talking about you know big data, you're talking about security, you're talking about mobile, you're talking about social, you're talking about the enabling infrastructure, everything is evolving and innovation is taking place in all of those areas simultaneously. But interestingly enough, they're all interrelating and interplaying on one another. So the so the level of sort of collective innovation is unprecedented. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of of maybe what you might have seen in the Renaissance in Florence. It's just this flurring of creativity when the status quo is being challenged at basically every level. So from that perspective, it's an, it's a, it's an era that's just ripe with opportunity. Of course, you've got to cut through the noise to find the things that really are for a venture capitalist investable ideas. Yeah, and you guys are looking for things that are going to be 10, 100x, uh, you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, 100x is, you know, when that happens, it's called serendipity. Uh, but what we're looking for is, is ideas. You know, we're an early stage investor. Classically, 80% of what we do is, is first institutional round. So we're really in the business of investing in people with ideas. And we're looking for ideas and a team of people that can take that idea and grow a long-term sustainable business. We're not into capturing lightning in a jar. We're not looking to time markets. Uh, you know, we take a longer term horizon where we can build sustainable value. So you're not looking for the next Instagram? No, you know, it, it's, I'm, not <laughs> sure, I'm not sure you know, you know, you look for those things. I think or you Snapchat see, is yeah, yeah, you, you know, you, you, see, you see great ideas, but you know, we're, we're a little bit more into bricks and mortar infrastructure. Um, you know, frankly, from an investor's perspective, it gives you a little bit more optionality in terms of how you go to the marketplace. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, so if, you know, if you have things that are very, very specific, sort of vertically oriented, you either nail it or you miss it. If you're, if you're looking at infrastructure, enabling technologies like security, like virtualization, internet of things, you know, it's more of a horizontal play, which means there's a lot more flexibility in terms of where you're going to get the initial traction in the marketplace. Yeah. It also means, frankly, it's easier sometimes to build long-term sustainable value. You know, a lot of these really interesting, and, and not to dismiss them, but very interesting narrow verticals, uh, you know, somebody comes up with a great idea, it gets acquired, it gets integrated, it goes away. Now, those acquisitions can be for really significant numbers, and, and we've seen that. And if you're in one of those, that's good news, there's no bad news there. But you can't really predict how those things are going to develop. So we tend to look for things where, you know, we'll look for business problems requiring significant high-value technology-based solutions more horizontal in nature, where we can do something significant long term, as opposed to trying to, to ride a wave and just time it right and then we all get rich. Not the business we're in, at least not at least. And there's still opportunity there. I, I just interviewed uh, the CIO of Facebook, uh, Tim Campos, and he said people, entrepreneurs should hang out with me because I could give them 10 business ideas for how to, how to do enterprise software in a whole new way that even Workday didn't see, right? No, every, at least I, all the rules are up for redefinition, and, and, and that's what's exciting. And that's why I describe this kind of as, this feels like the Renaissance, the modern Renaissance based here in San Francisco. And it's, it's an exciting period of time. You know, and there are aspects of it that remind me a little bit of 
1999 and 2000 when we were going through another renaissance. Yeah, when you have kids turning down three billion dollars yeah, from yeah, Facebook. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like, I, ho I, I hope he went home and his mom slapped him and said, what are you thinking? But if he goes public for a hundred <laughs> billion in a few years. He, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I just, I've seen the movie too many times and I, I love it when there's a happy ending. But you know, sometimes the endings are, you know, the, the, f the first couple of acts are really exciting. They yeah. turn out not to be so, so we, we well. We all so remember like, Pointcast, right? Oh, absolutely the same right, kind of, Abs uh, absolutely right. There's, there's a whole series of those companies. And you know, they were great companies, but sometimes you, you kind of get caught up in the euphoria of creativity. Rocky? <laughs> He's always bugging me to turn off my phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it, you know it's, it's hard not to get caught up, yeah. you know, in, in the enthusiasm and the vibe and the energy. And Probably the viewers in here, but Rocky's phone went off and he's yeah, always yeah, giving me crap. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Rocky. So, yeah. Yeah. So, sometimes he's on, I'm on stage and he'll call my phone just to see if I turn it off. <laughs> With friends like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I had to give him help. <laughs> Oh, man. So anyway, so, um, you know, people, entrepreneurs get caught up in the frenzy when uh, their, their numbers are going well, exponential. Know, it, it, look, it's hard not to. You know, having yeah. built a couple of companies, I get it. You know, the, the, the definition of an entrepreneur is you've got to get up in the morning totally convinced that, you know, the laws of gravity, the rules of physics do not apply to you. That, no, you can fly. If you just believe and, and flap your arms hard enough, you will fly. And that's, you know, that's part of what drives an entrepreneur to, look, I don't care about the facts. Don't bother me with, with all the history. I'm different. This is different. My idea is different. And, and you need that, that hubris. But there's a, there's a flip side of that coin, which is, you know, okay, the laws of physics actually do apply. Yeah. And sooner or later, you know, it catches things and it pulls them back down to ground. So you've got to find a balance. And, you know, sometimes when the, when the euphoria is running full force, it, it's, it's hard to remember the duality that goes with being an entrepreneur. Let's switch to talk about the next uh, a few years. Um, mobile has happened. You know, I was at Salesforce yesterday yeah. and I got pitched a lot of new mobile apps that are really mature, really nice, really beautiful. And you can tell that platform is now at, at a level where it's, um, it's, it's happened and now it's a mature platform. Right? Yep. It's not, it, there's a billion people buying phones this year, but it, it's a known thing and it's hard for even Apple to innovate to right. do something crazy and new and different on a mobile phone. But we're seeing another pattern, which is uh, you, you add social and location and sensors and, we and wearable computers together with data innovation. Machine. Maybe it's the age of context. Yeah, I wrote, <laughs> wrote a book about this, right? <laughs> but I, I'm seeing a new uh, set of things. What, are you seeing the same pattern? No, uh, I mean, yeah, from I think people you know, pitching you. And yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, the, the areas that we tend to look at, you know, we're, we do a lot of security, we do a lot of virtualization, uh, we we do a lot of big data. We've actually been doing big data when. It, when it wasn't big data 15 years ago, um, you know. But when you when you look at mobile as a platform, it, mobile has arrived as a platform. There's no doubt about it. And you know, I think there's a, there there can be a temptation when you have a new platform to say, okay, the platform's out there, you know, it's done. What's next? Uh, you know, my experience has been actually that innovation runs in waves. Uh, you know, and the first wave is around the platform. The second wave is actually going to be much more interesting, which is going to be the evolution of applications and putting things into a broader context yeah. to borrow from things that you're writing about. You know, that's when things really become disruptive. You know, not that mobile devices aren't disruptive, they are. They allow us to do whatever we need to do, wherever we are, whenever we are. Yeah. That's fantastic. But what do you start building on top of that capability is where you really see sort of the full potential of a platform like mobile come into full play. Of course, it creates all sorts of issues, right? So the security issues, an area that we focus at, the privacy issues, you know, are, are gonna be, you know, the unintended consequences. I was having a conversation this morning up at a university uh, with the computer science guys, you know, talking about this, that they, they really need to integrate some of the, some of the ethics uh, related social consequences into the discussion of what they're teaching in computer science, because just because we can do some things in some of these areas doesn't mean we necessarily should, or that we shouldn't do it. At least being mindful of what are the unintended consequences. You know, the, we always talk about the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And when you get into things like mobile, you start looking at issues like privacy. Uh, you know, that that propensity for everything that people are doing is motivated by improve the user experience, deliver value to the consumer. It's all good. You know, the problem is that that process of creeping incrementalism where you wake up one day and you realize, I've lost my privacy, how the hell did that happen? Yeah. I was talking with a security guy uh, actually yesterday over lunch, 
and it talked about, and, you know, kind of tells you, you know, what he thinks is fun. But, you know, looking on, on his uh, mobile device, looking at, you know, people around him at restaurants and things like that, he identified one person, uh, found out who the person was, went to Facebook, found out it was her birthday. She was selling her bir celebrating her birthday at a restaurant, uh, walked into her. And he did this, he told me, he said, in five to seven minutes, walked into her in the restaurant, had never met her before, wished her a happy birthday, shocked her. She says, how, who are you? How do you know? And says, look, you know, you, you're broadcasting your location. I knew where you were. I went to Facebook. I got your name. I got your picture. I could recognize you. I have your phone number and your home address, too, if you'd like it. Unintended consequences. Yep. And so, you know, this is going to be kind of an interesting. There's a security element to it. There's a privacy element to it. There will be a regulatory element to it. But that's all part of what weaves through this fabric of innovation as it relates to mobile. Makes it yeah. interesting. It's going to get far worse than that. I, I think it's going to get far worse than that. Absolutely. Because uh, right outside the store in Geekdom, San Francisco, we have a co-working co facility. Yeah. Estimotes is out here. They make low energy Bluetooth radios. That radio spits a number in the air. Well, our iPhones can tell how, far, how close we are. Right. By the way, each of our iPhones has one of these radios built into it, so I can tell how close I am to you, yeah. and on and on and on. Well, one of the things I've been looking at is, is frankly, is, is there a way you know, to, to toggle on or off privacy? You know, can, can I defeat uh, you know, some, of the, some of the guys that we work Good with? Good luck with that. Well, it's, you know, it, I mean, I hope it's not an existential question, right? I'm but having dinner with Richard Stallman tonight, and he wears a button, pay cash for everything. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I, I've got a good friend of mine, one of our advisors, who, uh, who did a lot of work with the intelligence community and probably, you know, supporting a lot of these programs that are designed to collect data and, and run analytics. And it's like, okay, you know, you, you, know, you created a lot of this stuff. Now, now how do we defeat it? Not, not, not for nefarious, you know, there's, yeah, there are people out there that want to, defeat location for nefarious reasons, but just for privacy. You know, what, what if you want to turn this stuff off? And some of it you can turn off, some of it you can't turn off. Yeah. You know, and, and I think there's... there's uh, you know, a cell tower company, AT&T right. and Verizon needs to know where your phone is. Ab to, absolutely right. Otherwise you can't make a call, yeah. right? So, that's so, how the technology you know, so, so how do you know, I mean, the, the whole social discussion, yeah, I think it's going to be another one of those examples where the technology gets so far ahead of the societal discussion about, you know, what are the rules for engagement? If yeah. you look at how we, how we view privacy in the U.S., versus how the, the Europeans view privacy. US, it's opt out. You know, Europe, it's opt in. You know, the rules around protecting privacy, a personal identifiable information, much more stringent there. Yeah. And you know, we're, we're driving the innovation here in Silicon Valley and in the United States. Uh, and unfortunately, the policy discussion is way behind. I, and I'm saying you're gonna opt in anyways, no matter what. I think the privacy argument is biased a bit right now because nobody knows the utility that's gonna show up for giving your privacy away. Right. And there is gonna be deep utility. I mean, I, you know, I was in Chicago in a United Airlines jet, mm -hmm. and I was at the, in the jet, right. and I was watching TripIt. Right. And while TripIt, I gave it some private information. I gave it my plane tickets and some other information, yeah. and it told me, oh, your plane's being canceled. Yeah. Here's three. Uh, here's uh, another plane getting out right. of town. Right. I got one of three seats, yeah. and then a couple minutes yeah. later, five minutes later, the pilot. They make the announcement, right? The pilot came on, and there was only two seats left. You, you got that smirk on your face. You know? like... And so, by giving private information up, you get a lot of good. When you walk into a smart grocery store in the future, right. you're going to get discounts. You're going to get new experiences. Right. That's that's all. Those are all the yeah. benefits, right? And and you know, who's not to, who's not to like that? Yeah. You know, it's it's the unintended consequences. And you know, you know, technology is, is dual use, right? It can be used yeah. for good. It can be used, you know, not always for the, the purposes for which it was intended. So it's it's going to be an interesting discussion. We did a privacy company probably 15 years ago, kind of when the web was coming into full bloom, and everybody was you know was total, terribly concerned about what about all the privacy issues. We built a great company, great solution, went to market with our friends at American Express, kind of on the corporate side, uh, killer solution. Nobody cared. You know, so it was that's that, where I'm going. You know, so I, it was that, it was that existential risk, but nobody I, cared. I know nobody cares because they're all using credit cards, right? Right. It, 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 you know, back to Richard Stallman's button. Yeah. You know, use cash for everything. If everybody cared about privacy, we wouldn't be using credit cards and, yeah. and gifting Visa with all of our. Well, I mean, I mean, the, the, the risk is, is is we buy into it, we engage yeah. in all these behaviors, and then when there's an unintended consequence, we scream foul. Yeah. Where the opportunities is uh, with privacy is. Uh, I think trust is going to be the new currency. I think we that's say, exactly we say right. that in our book. Yep. And how do I trust a company like Rackspace or Amazon? Ab absolutely or right. Um, first of all, be transparent. Yep. Tell me what you're collecting. Like right. Google does at google.com slash privacy. How you're using it. Not, not how. 
just show me everything you're collecting so I know at least, okay, I'm being stalked right. and I'm being tracked. <laughs> yeah. and, like yeah. that girl was surprised at how yeah. much yeah. data was out yeah. there about her, right? And she put it all out there. And she did. Yeah. And I put it all out there, my phone number and, and yep. all that is out there. Uh, two, make it correctable. Because I live on a g golf course, and some of these uh, personal digital assistants, mm -hmm. you know, like G uh, Google Now is one is the famous example, but right. there's about 15 of them, and one of them kept telling me stuff about golf because I live on a golf course. Right. Just like, uh, no, no. I, I hate golf. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's landscaping for me. And right? so, yeah. but it's not correctable. I right. can't tell it to shut no, up. No. Right. And then the third thing is make it turn off at certain times. Uh, you know, if you're having sex. Uh, tell the connect to turn off in your right. bedroom and right. tell, tell right. the Fitbit on that you're wearing to turn off yeah, and the yeah, yeah, yeah. watching. Yeah, take, you know, take a break. You know, take yeah. a break, you because know, <laughs> right. I don't want to be stalked at this time, right? <laughs> or maybe you do. Yeah. I, I, actually, yeah. that's Shelly. If you field. get to decide after the fact, yeah. Well, no, he, his argument was t turn it off. My argument is let's change the mores <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and play new kinds of games. I'll, right? I'll, t I'll tell you once I know the results. <laughs> that's right. yeah. Yeah. And that's the benefit. That's where where we don't know yet the utility right. that it's going to show up by sharing your your private information with other people or well, with and, and systems. I, and I think your point about being able to correct inaccuracies, how, how are you to find that is, is is right on the money. Right now, everything you do is is recorded and reported somewhere. Uh, it may or may not be accurate. It may or may not be seen in the right context. Uh, you know, as we tr as we transform to sort of a digital persona, how do we make sure that that digital persona is accurate and reflective? Yeah. Uh, and you know, and that again, that that comes. There's a privacy angle to that. So, so uh, two things I'm seeing happen to business is one, the, uh, every business is going to need to know or track everything about everything. And I, I didn't even understand all all of what that meant. But Uber knows where every customer is in real time. Every employee is in it real time. Every piece of inventory in real time. Uh, every transaction and even a lot of what causes transaction like a baseball game's going on right now so send more mach right. more more inventory to the baseball game at the yep. end of the baseball game because yep. there's going to be a lot of yeah, a so lot it's, of it's sort of you know, part of the internet of things context really yeah. you know there's so there's going to be predictive inventory yep. there's gonna, but if you, if your business doesn't see everything about everything you're not yet ready for the next stage and the second thing is we're going to need to know our customers in way more detail than we do today which means we're going to need to know a hundred times more, uh, have a hundred times more data flow. Yeah. You know, Twitter today is getting 500 million tweets a day, which is crazy when you yeah. think about it, where, where it's come from in seven years. But it's doubling every year, and we're going to need what to serve this new world? Yeah. It, well, you know, there was, there was a guy back in the 70s, a futurist, by the name of Alvin Toffler. Yeah. I remember that, wrote Future Shock. Yeah. And, and I, I tell people, grab that, you know, it, it may have been 40 plus years ago, grab that book and read it. Because Toffler talked about mass customization, mass personalization, you know, and that's the era that we're we're entering into today. You know, whether it's the Internet of Things, whether it's the collection of information, personalized offerings, uh, whether it's 3D printing with mass customization, uh, you know, all of the things that Toffler talked about. Interestingly enough, I, I think, you know, when I read the book at the time, it was like, well, this, this is really kind of cool and interesting, but this is a bunch of science fiction. Yeah. And here you are, 40 plus years later. And the things that Toffler talked about are, you know, are lining up, you know, pretty much in the way that he described. And so, you know, it, it's one thing to kind of sit down and try and figure all this out organically. You know, my approach is two ways to get through the minefield. There's the Braille method, relatively yeah. high attrition rate, or go get, or go get a map. Well, when you talk about things we're discussing today. Toffler's a great read. Your book's going to be a phenomenal read, I think, the things that you well, touched I, on. Well, so. we just noticed these patterns are coming out of the R&D lab yep. and becoming real, right? Yep. Uh, Toffler was a true visionary and yep. saw him 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I need so to have like, some of what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever he was taking. Because <laughs> yeah, so. I didn't see that 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And, you know, even uh, we joke around, the guy who built Google Glass, uh, Thad Starner, he wrote of what it does in 91, yeah, right? So yeah. 20 years ago. Well, and, and we had I, I, one of our old funds, uh, you know, 17, 18 years ago, uh, we had a, a visualization technology attached to the eyes uh, that would project a screen in front of you. So, you know, a lot of these things, you know, we've seen this yeah. time and time again, right? There's the, there's the concept when we did the original iPhones, right on the money with concept, timing. You know, the ecosystem has to form around the innovation to support it and give you a sustainable value proposition. Uh, that's always, you know, in our business and technology in general, I think that's that's one of the toughest things. You can be right on the fundamentals. It's getting the timing right and understanding that ecosystems need to develop around a lot of this innovation in order to really get traction and be sustainable. It's, it's 
probably the biggest challenge. So at Rackspace, we have huge data centers. You know, they're not the hugest, but they're pretty big. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of servers mm -hmm. all. Now we're all SSD, mm -hmm. all with high-speed interconnects. What's needed in the data center of the future? Because you, you study the infrastructure, right? You know, so you invest in cloud computing and, and well, I think you know. When you, I think when you look at the enterprise in particular, I mean, you know, cloud computing. Obviously, you know, the, again, we think about it as a relatively new concept. It's you know, I, I have a couple different perspectives on that. I have the current view of this. I have IBM talking about utility computing 15 years ago. Yeah. The same basic concept. And once upon a time, the cloud was called a mainframe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the, there's there's. But There's a mainframe was a centralized, was, 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 with was, one was, big processor but, 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 but or a, but a, sh a shared resource. Yeah. So it depends on how you want to abstract it, but a shared resource you know, driven by economics. And then you know, PC innovation comes along, changes the economics, allows for distributed computing, and we go through that, that entire wave. I think you know, when, you, when you look at cloud-based computing today, it certainly you know, it changes a lot of the economics around computational capability. Uh, but I think there are, there are limitations. Uh, when you start talking about wanting to utilize cloud infrastructure in those economics in an enterprise environment, for example, cloud's not ready for prime time, you know, for mission critical, you know, killer applications. I don't know. I, you know, there's yeah. 130,000 people here to hear Mark Benioff well, you know, talk you know, about cloud. Well, you know, you know, that's you know, that's a that's a flavor. But if you right. talk if you talk about you know walking into General Electric in their data centers where they spend you know 700 million dollars a year. How, how quickly does that flip over to a cloud-based infrastructure? There's a lot of work that needs to be done there uh, around you know, uh, scalability, on-demand, cloud gives you a lot of that today, but the issues around security. Uh, you know, how do you create an infrastructure which allows you to run across multiple cloud infrastructures with the confidence and the security, the integrity, uh, before you start deploying sort of mission critical applications. Before, if you're a hedge fund, you know, or a large investment bank, you're going to start putting the clearing network out there. Yeah. You're going to start putting the trading models out there. You know, that's highly sensitive, can't get it wrong, big bucks on the table, and there's a level of assurance yeah. uh, that needs to be there, confidence that needs to be there for that to happen. So That's why we love the hybrid cloud, because uh, we, we know that certain businesses still are going to need their own infrastructure ex separate from everybody ex else. Ex exactly, right? exactly right. But, you know, but again, all of these, you know, we, we, we tend in technology to talk about, you know, it's the year of. Well, yeah. in, in fact, you know, those are sort of mini epochs. Uh, where there's an evolution that takes place. You know, technology has rudimentary capabilities. It finds those early adopters. The technology evolves. The adopter universe expands. You know, and then finally you go mainstream, which is where you've nailed down. You know, all of the issues that are the corner cases. And so, certainly in cloud and virtualization, you know, uh, working on some things right now. We got a number of companies in virtualization. Can uh, you tell me about any of them? I can tell you about two of them. I can't tell you about one of them. One of them I can't tell you about is, is really virtualized uh, data center for the enterprise. I'm interested. So yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm interested too. <laughs> the CEO's not interested in me talking about it. Though. Have but him give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, you know, it's, it's it's a team of guys. Third time I've backed them over the last 15 years. They know what they're doing, uh, and uh, you know, it's going to be a really exciting project to watch. Uh, but you know, we've got a company in our portfolio called Axient. Uh, you know, Axient is, is a flavor of virtualization where they pro for SMBs, uh, they provide backup, but more than that, I mean, backup to the point where, uh, you know, if you look at the hurricane, you know, last year on the East Coast, uh, a lot of their customers got wiped out. Well, they back up not just the data, they back up the entire image of your computing infrastructure so that you can now operate everything from the cloud. Uh, so the data is secure, but the entire operation is operating in the cloud. So, you know, that provides a lot of continuity assurance, a lot of security protection, a lot of flexibility in terms of how you deploy. We have yeah. a company in the portfolio called Coraid, uh, which is a software-defined storage, you know, another flavor of virtualization. Uh, a lot of this is driven by economics. I, I think most technology at the infrastructure level, it's driven by changing the economics and how well, capability we, is deployed. We saw a big change this year, year that uh, SSD is becoming uh, Absolutely affordable right. for yep. on, on a data center wide. And that means that everything's going to change in terms of, uh, you know, you don't run Oracle anymore, you run Mongo maybe, or something right, even right. newer that was optimized for SSD. Right? That's exactly right. Because yeah, so. there's no more spinning platters that no, uh, no, data gets pulled off yeah. the head. It's, you it's know, and, and what happens, different. I mean, you know, it, 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 that, will, that will challenge the old guard, um, but it will also enable us to do things we haven't envisioned before. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you know, a lot of these areas, you know, we, we do a lot of work in security. You know, when I look at the security world, you know, I really view two buckets. 
One is a legacy bucket. You know, we've got a, basically an architecture today that was defined 45 years ago. We didn't have the computational capability. We didn't have the storage capability. We didn't have the connectivity velocity. We didn't have access to the data. So there was an architecture that developed an environment where those, yeah, you thought about those things, but you don't think about them the way you do today. So, you know, one bucket of security innovation is how do you secure that? Yeah. You know, all the gaps. Uh, and, and that's going to take years. I mean, you, there's systems out there still running COBOL. And I don't know if anybody's written a line of COBOL in 20 years, right? Well, there, there are. <laughs> in Miami, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe they're the, the, the new vanguard. You know, the other side of security, though, is, is envisioning a future where we do have this computational capability. We do have all the data available. We have transfers at the speed of light. And you start building, you know, basically entirely new computing paradigms with security as one of the determining factors. It's no longer you know, an afterthought or, oh yeah, we need to think about that. It's like, no, it's one of the guiding principles around which we build this infrastructure, we build this application, because the consequences of getting it wrong you know, are now acutely aware to all of us yeah. in a way that you know, they, necessarily, they weren't uh, necessarily 45 years ago. And Microsoft went through this uh, 10 years ago when they had all the virus problems. They still have some problems, but they, you know, um, I think it was Mike Howard wrote a book this big for all the Microsoft engineers to figure out how to write secure code because they right. didn't know how to do that. Right, because you, you were after functionality and then you were after performance. And security was, well, you know, why would anybody do that? Yeah. Well, you know, when you get to the world of security, you know, all of a sudden, particularly, you know, in a, in a global digitalized economy, you know, the substrate upon which that entire thing exists is this digital infrastructure. Now, and, now the engineers at, at companies like Google and Rackspace are trying to figure out how to keep the NSA out of our, out of our well, system. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's back to that two sides of the same coin. It's like, it's, it's, it's keep me safe, but you know, give me my space. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a challenge. Let's talk a little bit about the conference uh, that's coming up, uh, IBF. Tell me about this conference I'm well, so, so, so you know, one of the things I think you know, interesting in, in, in the world today is that corporate venture capital as, as you know, corporate venture capital runs through cycles. And we're in a cycle right now where corporate venture capital is, is, is really feeling its own. You know, there are, uh, by various counts, 750 to 900 venture, corporate venture capital programs in the world today. You know, in the US, there are probably two to 300 active venture capital firms. So there's actually more corporate venture capital operations than there are US venture capital firms. And, uh, you know, the IBF conference, uh, the Corporate Venturing Innovation Partnering Conference takes place uh, every year down in uh, Newport Beach. This year will be the 16th. I've had the pleasure of, of being the chair of that program since inception. And, and really what it does is it brings together, you know, the corporations, um, you know, who have, who understand what's going on in innovation uh, and realize that the old way of doing innovation wholly internally just doesn't work. The market's moving too fast. Uh, and so corporations, you know, driven by necessity have realized they've got to find a way to, to tap into this innovation ecosystem that we all take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. And the Corporate Venturing Conference is, is really where the corporations kind of come together, you know, try and figure it out together, share their experiences, what works, what doesn't work. You know, how do they develop new DNA that kind of moves away from the historical command and control, you know, R&D focus to we've got to go out and find a way to collaborate with all these young upstarts that basically want to kick our ass, you know, and eat our lunch. Yeah. How do we find a way to co-opt these guys in a way that we can work together? So, so this conference will bring together probably 400 people this year, and it's going to be great to, be great to have you there talking because yeah. the things that you're looking at today are ground zero for the business issues well, that each of these corporations are working let's with. Let's talk about a couple of them. You know, uh, New Relic, for instance, who, who visited here. I, I, I'm seeing a new tool set for anything. If you start uh, building anything, anything on top of cloud or on, on your own infrastructure, start building a business, you're going to need a, a certain tool to help you build that faster. Right. Uh, New Relic is one example. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, DevOps companies you know, that, that help you uh, yep. uh, deploy things fast. So if you all of a sudden get, get popular and you need 10,000 server instances, you can uh, you know, use Puppet or Chef or Ansible Labs, or mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole, a whole bunch of them. Right. Are, are you seeing tooling like that, uh, that, that, that you're investing in? You know, these kinds of companies that help other companies build faster? Or yeah, you know, it's, I mean, you know, the, one of the really interesting challenges about, you know, if you look at the venture capital industry, the, the history of investing in tools is not a particularly attractive one. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's been a bit of a challenge. You know, it, I, when I first became a venture capitalist after being an operating guy, that's one of the things that you know my partners used to tell me is no money in tools, and I, I said, well, you know, Lotus One Two Three, I call that a tool. Yeah. So before we jump to these broad 
you know, broad stroke, you know, generalizations, let's step back a little bit. You know, I think one of the challenges in a lot of the building block tool companies is a lot of this stuff is open source. You know, I come out of an open source environment. I understand the economics of that, and it could be a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, and so you know, I think we the, love it. I, I, hey, I, you know, we gifted OpenStack. You know, I, I think in a, in a lot of ways, you know, um, it, it's it is a, it's a very very beneficial. It allows innovation to accelerate, and that, in, in by and large, is a good thing. It's just figuring out the economics to go along with open source innovation can be a little bit of a challenge. But yeah, it's, you know, again, it's all the rules. You know, it used to be you'd have technology, you'd hold it tight, you'd protect the hell out of it. Uh, you know, and now it's like, you got a great idea, throw it out there and see where people go with it. Well, it's you also, know. if you're a, a, a two person or a 50 person startup, you, you want to focus on what you're going to do and DevOps ain't it. Right. You know, right. if you're trying to build a no, taxi exactly company, right. well, or you're you know, trying I mean, to build I mean, a... Te te technology goes through these, these cycles, right? There's an innovation cycle where you, you, you start with disruptive innovation. If that disruptive innovation is successful, it will be emulated by your competitors. Yeah. And if that emulation takes hold, uh, you will move to a level of componentization, standardized functionality, and that leads to commoditization. And I think one of the things, you know, the large corporations in particular are becoming to realize is that they need to understand that cycle. And they need to learn, how do we take advantage of stuff when it's componentized and commoditized, as opposed to reinventing the wheel? You know, and focus my R&D dollars on those things that are truly differentiated. Same thing applies to a startup. You know, once upon a time, you go back, you know, 15 years ago when we were doing web-based things, what did it cost to build a website? You know, to, what does it cost I, today? $100,000 today, it's yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, fun, functionality all standardized. Okay, we figured that out, we know how to do that. Or go to well, Wix and you get it for free. That's exactly <laughs> right, yeah. Just, just keep moving up the value stack. Yeah. You know, by and large, that's a, that's a virtuous thing. But the corporations, you know, they got this old command and control, you know, mentality, big R&D budgets, and it just can't move with sort of the resiliency or the agility that innovation today that's driving this global economy, you know, requires. It's why they've, it's why the corporations have come back in such a serious way. And you know, it's I was looking at some statistics this morning, you know, 30% of the investment dollars in the U.S. last quarter were from corporations, 30%, north of $2 billion. That's that's a frickin' big number, yeah. you know? And now, is that, is that the high water mark? Historically, corporations kind of tap out at about 20% on an annual basis of capital going into startups. You know, 30%, probably a bit of an anomaly. But I wouldn't be surprised this year if we start banging up against that 20% threshold. And you know, we'll, see if, we'll see if it's a bubble. We'll see if it's sustainable. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, back to the conference. Who should be coming to this conference? Well, the corporate, I mean, the conference, uh, I don't know, if we, Rocky, we've got that slide. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, the bulk of people at this conference are corporations that are looking at innovation, they're trying to figure out how do they, yeah, up there. you know, how do they, how do they tap in to, you know, what we would consider, you know, the innovation economy here in the Valley. You know, finding ways to partner with these, you know, these young entrepreneurs, you know, bringing their strengths and capabilities, which is basically brand distribution, market knowledge, tying that together with the innovation driven by young companies uh, who don't have the brand, who may not have the market knowledge, and certainly don't have the distribution. So, you know, a lot of this ecosystem is about trying to bring these two communities together, you know, for mutual benefit. So the people at this conference uh, are corporate executives uh, that are interested in how do we change our innovation paradigm, how do we become more aggressive, and then folks that kind of live around that periphery of trying to reinvent how corporations innovate. Uh, you know, my own, my own first company, I think we've talked about this in the past, uh, it was at a point in time where I was running a software company and venture guys didn't like software. Yeah. You know, that, that whole thing about if there's no hardware involved, we're not really interested. You know, I built that company on the back of three strategic relationships, Motorola, uh, AT&T, and Apple Computer. And so I lived through firsthand, uh, you know, all the challenges associated with bringing these two. There's an impedance mismatch between these two cultures, there's no doubt about it. There are challenges that go with that. But when you get it right, uh, you know, the leverage that you can get for a startup is, is huge. And let's think about it from the startup's point of view. The corporation will take care of itself. But from a startup's point of view, the leverage, if you get it right, is huge in terms yeah. of mitigating risk, accelerating growth, lowering your capital requirements, and improving your probability of success. Now, that's why I like these companies like New Relic, because it does exactly that. It Absolutely helps, right. It helps you innovate with lower risk and cheaper costs. Well, I mean, look, that's, that's the big thing, right, in innovation. Everybody likes the upside when it's successful. It's that small matter of implementation that's littered with risk. So yeah. the question is, how do, you, how do you rip some of that risk out, kind of in a program deterministic way? And so corporations being involved in the innovation ecosystem is a set of important tools. I can speak from my own experience. Uh, you know, I've had 40 corporations as LPs in our funds. 
You know, so I've, I've seen it from their perspective, I've seen it from the entrepreneur's perspective, I've seen it from the venture capital's perspective. It's powerful, it's compelling, it's not easy, but if you make the investment and you get it working for you, it's, uh, it's significant. Very cool. Where do we find you on the internet? So Bob Ackerman, uh, Ackerman at AllegisCapital.com or www.AllegisCapital.com. Very cool. Thank you so much. For Robert, it's always good talking to you. Thank you.